In this video, I will discuss several powerful methods that are widely used to describe properties of electric circuits. We will discuss two simplest types of electric connections, review the concept of equivalent resistance, and finish by studying Kirchhoff's rules. In the next few minutes, we will explore ways to compute currents I and potential differences delta V in simple circuits such as the one shown on the right. In this circuit, several resistors are connected sequentially to each other. If we also connect these resistors to an electric battery, there will be an electric current through the resistors. If the electromotive force of the battery is constant, the current will also reach a nearly constant value after some time delay. We will focus on equations describing such constant currents, which are also called direct currents or steady currents. Because the currents do not change with time, the mathematical description is simpler than in the general case. So we will review properties of currents while neglecting their time dependence. However, many of today's ideas will also apply when currents do change with time. The currents depend on the order in which the elements are connected. Simplest electric elements, such as resistors, have just two terminals to connect to the rest of the circuits. The current enters such element through a terminal with a high electric potential, or the plus terminal, and exits the element through the terminal with a lower potential, or the minus terminal. In the drawing, the plus and minus terminals of the resistor are indicated by letters A and B. If we now have two elements, let's say resistors R1 and R2, and we wish to connect them to an external circuit, let's say a better with EMF delta V, you can easily figure out two ways to connect R1 and R2 to the circuit. In the first type of connection, called connection in series, you connect the two elements sequentially. This means that the plus terminal of R1 is connected to the plus terminal of the battery, the plus terminal of R2 is connected to the negative terminal of R1, and the negative terminal of R2 is connected to the negative terminal of the battery. In this arrangement, it's easy to see that the current I that goes through R1 will also flow through R2. For the resistors in series, you can write two simple equations that allow you to find currents and potential differences. For the currents, we have that I1, the current through R1, is equal to I2, the current through R2, and of course it is equal to the current I that enters R1 and exits R2. This simply reflects the fact that charge is conserved inside the resistors. On the other hand, the total potential difference delta V across R1 and R2 is equal to the potential difference across R1 plus the potential difference across R2. By Ohm's law, the potential difference across R1 is equal to I R1, and similarly, the potential difference across R2 is equal to I times R2. So therefore, we have that delta V is equal to I times R1 plus I times R2. If you don't want to connect the resistor sequentially, you can use an alternative connection in parallel. When two resistors are connected in parallel, the plus terminals of both R1 and R2 are connected to the plus terminal of the battery, and similarly, the minus terminals of R1 and R2 are connected to the neg negative terminal of the battery. In this case, ends of both resistors are attached to a pair of points, A and B, called junctions, whether the current going out of the battery splits into several streams, I1 and I2, and similarly, where two streams I1 and I2 merge back into the total current I that goes into the battery. Since both resistors in this case are connected to the same points A and B, the potential difference across each resistor is the same. Delta V1 is equal to delta V2 is equal to delta V. On the other hand, the current I that enters point A must be equal to the sum of the currents leaving that point, I1 plus I2. Similarly, the total current entering point B, I1 plus I2, must be equal to the total current I that leaves this point. 
we get the same equations for the conservation of currents at points A and B. I1 and I2 are generally not the same. The ratio I1 to I2 is equal to the ratio of R2 divided by R1. The same rules for connections in series or in parallel also apply when we connect more than two elements. Suppose we have n resistors and first connect them in series. In this case, as before, the positive uh, terminal of resistor R2 is connected to the negative terminal of resistor R1. The positive terminal of resistor R3 is connected to the negative re uh, terminal of the resistor R2 and so on. Using the same logic as we applied in the case of two resistors, we can show that the current through these N resistors is the same. I1 is equal to I2 equals uh, to I3 and so on. While the potential differences across resistors add up. So we have I times R1 plus I times R2 plus I times Rn is equal to delta V. On the other hand, when we connect resistors in parallel, all their positive terminals are connected to the same point and similarly for the negative terminals. In this case, the potential differences across each resistor are the same, while the currents that enter the junction points must be equal to the currents that leave the junction points. In other words, I1 plus I2 plus I3 and so on must be equal to the current I that enters the junction point. Another useful concept introduced in this chapter is equivalent resistance. Very often, we have several elements connected together and wish to know the total resistance of the whole circuit. This total resistance is known after the name of equivalent resistance. Let's say we have two resistors in series and we would like to find out the total resistance of the system, for instance, to know the total consumed power of the circuit. In this case, it is easy to show that the equivalent resistance of two resistors REQ is equal to R1 plus R2 because delta V across R1 and R2 is equal to I times R1 plus R2. So R1 plus R2 plays the role of the total or equivalent resistance of both resistors. If we have N resistors in series, the equivalent resistance is equal to the sum of the individual resistances. REQ is equal to R1 plus R2 plus so on plus Rn. On the other hand, if we have elements in parallel, their equivalent resistance is found by a different equation. In this case, the reciprocal of the equivalent resistance is found by adding the reciprocals of R1, R2, and so on. Let's say we have two resistors, R1 and R2, connected in parallel. Then we can show that 1 over R EQ is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Since the total current I, which is equal to delta V over R EQ, is equal to the sum of currents through R1 and R2, I1 plus I2, and each of the individual subcurrents is equal to delta V over R1 and delta V over R2. If we have n resistors, the above rule generalizes to say that 1 over REQ is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 and so on. In this case, you must remember to take reciprocals of resistances on both sides of the equation. You take 1 over R1, 1 over R2 and so on and add them up. In the end, you take the reciprocal of the total sum to find the equivalent resistance. If you have a circuit that has parts connected only in series or in parallel, the equivalent resistance of the total circuit can be found by repeatedly applying the rules that we just discussed. In the short circuit shown on this slide, the resistors of 8 and 4 ohms are connected in series. Therefore, they can be replaced by equivalent resistance of 12 ohms. The 6 and 3 ohm resistors are connected in parallel According to our rules, we replace them by an equivalent resistance of 2 ohm by adding the reciprocals. Finally, the new resistances of 12 and 2 ohm are in series. We add them up to get 14 ohm, which is the equivalent resistance of the whole circuit.
So far, we studied connections in series or in parallel, which are the simplest. Although such connections are very common and easy to comprehend, they represent only a small class of connections that are encountered in electronic circuits. Many other types of connections exist, which are not purely serial or parallel. For such connections, we apply more general rules that are studied in electrical engineering courses. I would like to mention two examples of these more general rules. Sometimes a circuit is reduced not to one, but several equivalent resistances. A famous example of this kind is given by a star connection. Imagine we have a conducting triangle, which is connected to the outer circuit uh, at each of its three vertices, and whose sides have resistances R1, R2, and R3. You can easily see that these resistances are neither in series nor in parallel. However, such a triangle with three resistors is equivalent to a three-point junction with equivalent resistances REQ1, REQ2, and REQ3 inserted into each lead of the junction. The values of the three equivalent resistances are determined by the equations in terms of the original R1, R2, and R3. These equations are derived in advanced textbooks or three references available on the Internet. Let us pause for a second and think about this example. What we have just shown is that if a triangle connection with the resistances R1, R2, and R3 is embedded into a larger circuit, its effect on this larger circuit is exactly the same as that of a three-point star junction with equivalent resistances shown on this slide. Many natural or human-made electric circuits contain triangular connections. For any such circuit, we can apply the triangle star transformation to find a simple circuit with equivalent properties. Recently, I ran into a relevant example from geology. A porous rock is formed by a network of filaments connected in the form of triangles. The neighboring triangles are connected at their vertices indicated by A, B, C, and D. The resistance of each filament is R0. Let's say geologists need to fight the equivalent resistance of a part of the rock shown on the slide in the upper left corner. As the first step, they would replace each triangle with the resistances R0 by a star connection with the resistances R0 over 3. The star connections form a new triangle of their own, with the sides containing two resistances R0 over 3 in series, or the equivalent resistance of two-thirds R0. We can further replace this triangle by a star connection with the equivalent resistances 5 ninths of R0. Thus, the shown network of three triangles with R0 is equivalent to a star connection with 5 ninths of R0. Much simpler. But what if we need to answer a more detailed question? Say, we really need to know the currents that are flowing inside the triangle. For example, suppose we are given currents IA, IB, and IC entering the triangle through its vertices A, B, and C. Our task is to find the current such as I3, flowing through one of the resistors. We also know that the currents entering the triangle must add up to zero because of conservation of charge. We have IA plus IB plus IC equals to zero, and this means that some of the external currents are negative. That's okay, because the sign of the current depends on the convention. The negative current that flows in is equivalent to the positive current that flows out. If we are asked to find I3 inside the triangle, we cannot replace the triangle connection by a star connection. Instead, we should use a more general approach for computing currents in arbitrary circuits. We will employ a method first developed in the 19th century by Gustav Kirchhoff. Kirchhoff was a German physicist and engineer who contributed to many fields, including physics and chemistry. He and Robert Bunsen are known for laying foundations for the modern science of spectroscopy and discovering new chemical elements. When working on a particularly difficult homework assignment as a student in his graduate school, Kirchhoff discovered two rules 
that can be used to find I and delta V in arbitrary circuits. These rules reflect basic principles of the conservation of charge and conservation of energy in any circuit. They became the fundamental laws of electrical engineering. Kirchhoff's junction rule applies to any point with three or more connections. This rule states that the sum of the currents entering any junction must equal zero. Currents directed into the junction are entered into the equation with the plus sign and those leaving the junction with the minus sign. The, the charge that enters the junction per unit time must be equal to the charge that goes out of the junction during the same time. Therefore, Kirchhoff's junction rule reflects conservation of charge in any junction. Kirchhoff's loop rule applies to any closed path inside the circuit, called the loop. The only requirement for the eligible loop is that it must be closed. The loop can have any shape and contain any elements or no elements at all. It can be traveled in the, either the clockwise or counterclockwise direction. So you suppose you selected one such loop, then the Kirchhoff's loop rule tells you that the sum of the potential differences across all elements around this loop must be zero. This reflects conservation of energy inside this loop. Here is what you do when you apply the loop rule. First, you must select the directions of all currents through every element inside the loop based on your initial guess. You also select direction of the motion around the loop, clockwise or counterclockwise. The sign of delta V across each element will depend on both directions. Let's say your element is a resistance R and you traverse it by traveling from point A to point B. If your travel direction is in the same direction as the direction of the current, as in figure A, delta V across the resistor is equal to minus i times r. This is the value that you include in the loop rule. On the other hand, if you traverse the resistor in the direction that is opposite to the current, as in figure B, delta v that goes into the loop rule is plus i times r. If you encounter an EMF and the source of EMF is traversed in the direction of the EMF from minus to plus, as in figure C, the change in the electric potential e the EMF is delta V equals to plus E. On the other hand, if you go in the direction opposite to the EMF from plus to minus, the change in the potential is minus E. Your eventual goal is to write down a system of equations that has as many equations as the number of your unknown currents. In general, it is more preferable to use junction rules then loop rules. Use the junction rule as often as needed, so long as each time you write an equation, you include in it a current that has not been used in a previous junction rule equation. The number of times the junction rule can be used is generally one fewer than the number of junction points in the circuit. The loop rule is satisfied for any loop. It provides a useful equation only when a new circuit element, resistor or battery, or a new current appears in this equation. Again, you need as many independent equations as you have unknowns. When writing the Kirchhoff rules, you guess the direction of each current i. If, after solving the system of equations, some of the currents that you've got are negative, this simply means that the actual current is against the direction of your initial guess. You only get positive currents when the actual currents is in the direction that you initially guessed. Negative currents indicate that your initial guess must be adjusted and you should choose the opposite direction of the current. Let's apply this logic to our triangle. We first draw the guess directions of the currents I1, I2, I3 inside the loop. We also select the direction along the loop which is indicated by a thick arrow and chosen to be counterclockwise to get convenient signs of the currents. We write the loop rule I1 R1 plus I2 R2 plus I3 R3 equals 0. Then we express I1 and I2 using the junction rule at points B and C.
we plug in expressions for i1 and i2 into the loop rule and solve for i3. This is our final result. i3 is equal to icr2 minus ibr1 divided by the sum of r1, r2 and r3. Here is another typical problem. You are given a circuit with two EMFs, E1 and E2, and three resistors, R1, R2, and R3. You are asked to find the current I3 through the resistor R3. You first select two loops and select directions along these loops. The directions in which you follow the loops are chosen entirely by you. The final results will not depend on this choice. To find the solution, you first count the number of unknown currents. There are three unknown currents in this problem. Therefore, you need three equations. One equation is written for junction D. You know that I1 plus I3 is equal to I2. Then you write two uh, loop rules for loops 1 and loop 2. When you write, write the loop rules, you need to carefully choose the signs of each term according to the prescription discussed below above. Finally, you solve these three equations for the current I3. Here is the final result. In this video, you have learned several methods for computations of DC currents. Let us review their relative strengths. When you begin solving a problem, you wish to first select the most appropriate method for its solution. The simplest methods apply to the circuits consisting only of elements in series or in parallel. If you identify such a circuit, you can immediately apply equations for circuits in series or in parallel, which are relatively simple but are limited in their scope. If you need to find properties of the whole circuit, such as total current or consumed power, it is often beneficial to compute equivalent resistance. Finally, if the circuit is too complex or you need to know its detailed properties, you should use Kirchhoff's rules. These rules are most general and apply to a variety of circuits, but they typically lead to somewhat lengthier solutions.